Hello, I guess we're on here. We're live. Now, I think I should have my, um, I guess it isn't there yet. The, uh, yeah, I also like to check this out on, uh, on my iPad so that I can answer questions. So today, as we continue our 90 day challenge and I share these moments with you as I talk about my experience of learning uh, uh, Persian and Arabic and uh, talk about language learning in general and share ideas with you. Uh, today I want to talk about, you know, what is the best time to study? What is the best time to study languages? And talk to you a little bit about when I study languages. And of course, I'm interested in hearing from you when you study languages. All right. So um, I was thinking about this last night because at night when I study, um, I am more likely to be tired, more likely to feel I'm not getting anywhere, uh, more likely to feel frustrated, uh, feel that I've kind of hit a wall. Uh, the language doesn't seem fresh to me anymore. And yet in the morning, when I open up my iPad and do a lesson on link in Persian or Arabic, or even if I grab one of my books, I don't have an example here now, uh, the language is fresh. I'm curious. It's, it, it feels good to be back at it again. So, uh, you know, right off the bat, I would say that in my own experience, mornings are better than say 10 o'clock at night, just in terms of my, my brain being more receptive. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's research which shows, I'm just going to finish my tea here. Wouldn't be surprised if there's research that shows that um, our brains are, you know, to the extent that they can measure these things, are more receptive to new, new ideas that, that the neurons are firing more actively in the morning than they are at night. I just don't know that, but I know that's been my own experience. And I should say that even when I was in business, if I had a major problem to resolve, or we had a, a big issue, or a customer, you know, big, there was a big claim on some lumber, or supplier wasn't delivering, or any major problem, the worst thing you can do is to look at it at night, because everything looks better in the morning. I mean, everything is terrible at night. And uh, if you go to bed with the problem, it can even affect your sleep. So if I, uh, if I saw an email or a message that indicated that there was a problem and I happened to look at it at eight or nine o'clock at night, I didn't touch it uh, until the morning. And in the morning, I would find solutions. So this was no longer just a problem. It was a challenge and I could find solutions for it. So I think, um, you know, I think uh, this is uh, applicable to language learning. Now, for some reason, I don't seem to have, I was going to, check this with, uh, let me just see on my iPad here. Um, Call from Miller, Deloitte. Go away. Call from Miller, Deloitte. Call from Miller, Deloitte. Boy. So, um, yeah, so I think, uh, let me just see if I can find this here because I like to get your questions and uh, it doesn't seem to be up here. Um, and let's go to there and go to YouTube. See, I have my iPad running beside me. And uh, so, uh, there we go. Okay. Now I've got it up here now. All right. It's coming, I think. All right. So there's the question. When do you guys like to study? Uh, now we're going to also I have to. Okay. Now I've got there we go. And I've muted it. So there we go. So now I should point out that while mornings are great, uh, I don't just study in the morning. So if I uh, go to the gym at five, then I'll be listening. Um, so that, uh, and listening, of course, is also a big part of studying. So right now, for example, I have this story in Persian about Amir Kabir, who was a very famous person in the history of Iran. 
and I'm listening to it. I've listened to it quite a few times, and there's a lot of new vocabulary for me there. And I find that if I listen to it uh, a few times, it makes it easier for me to read. When I read it again, I look up new words, particularly because um, in, uh, in Farsi, in Persian, we don't have text-to-speech. And with all of its faults, text-to-speech is a great help in learning a language. All right. So there is the uh, subject matter. Now, for some reason, this doesn't show the, the chat box. So I'm going to have to get, sorry, uh, here we are. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. Let's just have a look here. Uh, OK, now we're up. All right, all right, OK. Now let's, so I, I've just launched that. And uh, let's see what sorts of reactions we get. How is everyone learning? Blah, blah, blah. What language are you learning? Happy Scribe for Hebrew. And I must say it works rather well, says Mark Chavez. Uh, okay, Happy Scribe. Uh, this has to do with these auto transcription services. And uh, I discovered these. I sent two examples, the one Vocalmatic and Happy Scribe to uh, Mark, my son. And he and some of the others in the office tested them, and they found that Happy Scribe was better than Vocalmatic for Italian. And so I'm going to go back to Happy Scribe. By the way, it's very strange because Happy Scribe, when I contacted them and said, "Do you do right to left?" they said no. But then I and, and the first time I put up my uh, Arabic podcast, it wouldn't do it right to left. But the second time, it did it in fact right to left. Now Mark says he's doing it in Hebrew. So obviously it does do it right to left. Uh, so I really, I mean, this is to my, to my mind, this is a phenomenal breakthrough. I'm straying from my subject of when I study, but I have spent a lot of my own money to transcribe in Romanian, in Greek, in Ukrainian, uh, in Arabic and uh, in Persian. And now for much less money, I go to something like Happy Scribe and like I think it's ten dollars a month I get an hour or something that's enough that keeps me busy or I can go up to thirty dollars and then I can transcribe a whole bunch of stuff so because we have this tremendous array of podcasts radio programs audio material that we can find on the internet in all of the languages that we are studying uh, the idea that we can for a relatively reasonable amount get uh, transcripts that are actually quite accurate and the transcripts come with date stamps. And so we are also exploring whether we can integrate the date stamps with the audio uh, in a lesson at link. Now, there's problems because if the podcast is longer than, say, the amount, the length of a lesson at link, then of course the audio goes into a second lesson, but you're not going to split. Yeah, you may want to go to the trouble of splitting the audio up to match the lessons. But these are some of the th things that we're looking at. There's always new things in um, language learning. I should point out that uh, Eric of our office tested uh, uh, Happy Scribe for Japanese. He said it was very good. And Mark uh, tested it for a very fast uh, exchange in Italian. And it was also very accurate. So automatic transcription is here. Try Happy Scribe and you can turn your favorite listening material into lessons that you can study at Link. Uh, yeah. Okay, because uh, I was wondering if you were Canadian, I'm Canadian, and they suck at speaking French over here. You can visit every time, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of back and forth. Steve, I study first thing in the day. I wake up at 5.30 and read. After breakfast, I do not have active listening. Okay, so yeah, early in the morning is better, says he. Mark, I enjoy studying, and maybe another hour in the evening. In the evening, I study much less intensively. Yeah, that's been my experience. I don't mind studying in the evening. And an evening would be maybe a good time to do something that's not too demanding, like watching a video. If, if you find a video on Netflix that's in Spanish and you're studying Spanish. So that the more intensive learning, uh, it seems to be, other people agree, is better to do it in the morning. Mateus also agrees. If you try to read something, you fall asleep. Uh, here is Jibbo. I prefer to do so in the morning, but I get up work at 6 a.m. Don't get home till 5 to 7 p.m. And then I'm exhausted. <laughs> That's the problem. The only advantage is that if we consider that uh, listening is a part of language learning. So if you go to work at early in the morning, whether you're in your car or on a train, unless there's too much ambient noise in the train or bus, that is also 
uh, time to study. Oh, t-shirts. Okay, I, I keep on forgetting. I got to bug the office on t-shirts. Uh, okay, how would you learn the Japanese writing system? Well, the Japanese writing system, of course, it consists of three, in effect, three writing systems. There's the Chinese characters, in Japanese known as kanji, and there's the hiragana and katakana. So hiragana and katakana, as many of you know, are two parallel syllabaries. So each sound represents a syllable. Ka, ki, ku, ke, ko. The syllable, in other words, combining a consonant and a vowel. Uh, and they're used, like the katakana is typically used for loan words or uh, onomatopoeia. In other words, words that represent the sound, like crash or something. Um, and those are relatively easy to learn because there's only 50 of them. The disadvantage with the katakana is it doesn't appear so frequently and therefore you more quickly get comfortable in hiragana and katakana takes longer. Uh, how do you learn them? You just learn the symbols and do a lot of reading. It, it, as with learning Arabic or any sort of alphabet or syllabary where a limited number of symbols reappear and reappear and reappear, after an initial period of kind of getting a sense of what the symbols represent, then the more you read and even the more you write, and that's why I found with Arabic and even when I did a little bit of Hebrew, using the dictation function as one of the review activities at Link, where you hear a word or a phrase and then you have to type it in. And uh, I found that very useful to get a better sense of what those symbols mean, same with Greek. Uh, particularly where it, in some of these older languages, the same sound can have three or four different symbols representing it. That's not an issue in Japanese. So I would do the dictation function at link in order to practice the katakana hiragana. When it comes to kanji, you know, I learned kanji a long, long time ago. I developed my own system. This was before there were any computer systems to help you. Uh, I wrote them all by uh, the first thousand. In fact, I wrote them all by hand. I had to write the first thousand. I made a specific effort to learn them using uh, flashcards and sort of a primitive spaced repetition system. After the first thousand, I encountered a new um, you know, character. I would write it out by hand. Uh, I had to, I mean, part of our assignment was to write things in Chinese, translate things into Chinese. So I had a lot of practice in writing. Now, I don't know whether writing is essential to learning the Chinese characters or the kanji in Japanese, but that's what I did. So there may be better ways of doing it today, but to learn to write and to read in Japanese, you need to cover the kanji, at least 2000 of them. And people say there's the Toyo, you know, the most commonly used kanji, but all kinds of kanji that are not in the 2000 most common kanji appear often enough in newspapers and books that you kind of need more than that in my experience so much for japanese writing and reading okay ah now happy scribe was good even for japanese yeah eric exactly which language do you plan to learn in the future okay well you know i, I don't like to make commitments too far forward because basically i'm retired i do what i want so right now i'm motivated to learn uh, persian and arabic and i kind of feel i'd like like to learn Turkish next because that makes like a tidy geographic and in a sense cultural group so that'll keep me busy for a while I mean I was four or five years on Russian before I expanded even to Czech or Ukrainian or Polish so you know there's no hurry the languages aren't going anywhere uh, I think that'll be quite a lot for me for the next couple of years and I would like to improve my Korean I would like to go back in and, and work on some of the languages that I took to a certain level and, and like to get them sort of over the hump, uh, so to speak. Uh, and then I will look at whatever, it might be Indonesian, it might be Swahili. I have a very good friend, one of my hockey playing, playing buddies in Vancouver, uh, who, who was in uh, Kenya uh, as a teacher uh, many years ago, and he has a lot of friends there. And we have talked about trying to get some Swahili content for Link, and if we get uh, Swahili at Link, I might learn Swahili. Uh, maybe in preparation for going uh, to, to Africa. I've never visited uh, Africa, I mean, south of the Sahara. So, time will tell. We will see. I might get interested in something totally different, too.
Okay, I want to keep studying Japanese, but I have no motivation at all. If you have no motivation, how can you say that? I want to keep studying Japanese, but I have no motivation. Well, then you don't want to study Japanese. Uh, if you kind of at some level feel you want to learn some language, but, but you're lacking motivation, you have to find something in the culture that motivates you. So, uh, you know, it could be a TV program, it could be music, it could be anything. You have to find something or a friend. There has to be something that brings motivation in, into it because without the motivation, you simply can't force yourself. It's like pushing on a rope. So find some way to motivate yourself or do something else. Do you ignore proper names, Latin or Greek origin or or do you ignore the words which don't exist in the language you are learning? Okay. Uh, I guess this refers to what, what I choose to save in link or what I choose to uh, give myself credit for as a known word. Uh, I would say that um, if I come across a name, then I ignore that so that I remove that from my statistics. Uh, but uh, Latin or Greek origin words, uh, those I count as known words if I acquire them in a new language. I mean, there are always loan words in in Persian. There are loan words from Arabic in Slavic languages. There are loan words from French or from or nowadays from English. So they all count. OK, how did you go with speaking with your dinner party? Oh, yeah, yeah it, it, it went fine. I, uh, you know, limited uh, uh, man. Uh, you know, nami dunam bez yor bez abone farsi sopak kona. Amo vakti ke dar josne josne tavolot zanam bo mekmon. Mehmon meaning Irani Midunistan be Farsi so like that. Anyway, forget it. I did fine. Uh, now, uh, what do you think about studying Chinese at university along with a degree in something else? Yeah, but remember, when you're studying at university, that's that might be the uh, the stimulus. It's a place where you get together with other students. It's where you get together with the teacher. Where you're you know, you're led to different resources. You might be stimulated about Chinese culture, but fundamentally you have to learn it on your own. So if you are at university and you have the time, uh, why not do Chinese? But make sure you put the effort in outside the classroom as well. Ahmed here, is Arabic an obstacle for you? It's not an obstacle, it's an opportunity, but it's difficult. I have to say Arabic is more difficult than Farsi or Persian. Uh, it's more difficult because the uh, the grammar is more complicated. Uh, I shouldn't say more complicated, but it's it's more different. Whereas Persian is an Indo-European language, so that it's the patterns are more comfortable, more familiar. Whereas in Arabic, uh, the the patterns are new to me, and so the brain obviously is going to have an easier time with patterns that are familiar. Uh, the writing system is also a little more. The connection between what's written and how it's pronounced is less systematic than it is in Farsi. So I'm finding Arabic difficult. However, you know, it's fun. I, I, I go to podcasts from Al Jazeera or France 24. I get them transcribed by Happy Scribe and I fight my way through them. And slowly, uh, you know, words like intikhabat, elections, or uh, whatever, you know, that are relevant, you know, that are reappear in these in these uh, lessons they're gradually becoming uh, a part of my vocabulary and i'm enjoying it uh, okay if you're studying two languages better start with your weak language or strong language okay um again i don't know um i started arabic first and then started doing uh, persian persian is a lot easier than arabic uh so for example for simple conversation, I can probably converse more comfortably, easy, easily in Persian. But if I listen to a political podcast in Arabic, I understand more of it than I do of the uh, Farsi. So 
uh, I think you have to explore that. And I think I wouldn't, again, do two languages. I'm doing it now for the purposes of this 90-day uh, challenge. But in fact, I, I want to, like, if I start the week in Arabic and then I go, oh, all right, now I have to switch to Farsi because I have my tutor and stuff. I kind of don't want to leave the one in order to go to the other. At first, I thought it helped to keep things fresh. But after a while, as you get into it more and more, you realize that you actually need to spend the time. So I wish instead that I hadn't committed to doing two languages, that I could focus on the one. On the other hand, at the end of the 90 days, I will have a certain level in both languages. So, you know, you've got to decide that for yourself. Okay, is it better to study your listening, losing focus or reading attention? Okay, when it comes to listening, if I sit down, I say, now I'm going to listen to Farsi or something. I can't do it. I lose focus. If I'm cleaning up, as I did after breakfast, which is why I was a minute or two late, because we had a late breakfast this morning, you know, International Women's Day. Uh, while I'm doing stuff, I actually fo focus better, because I, I, I don't know what it is, but if I can keep myself busy exercising, driving, even though I'm focusing in and out, I'm able to stay with it. Uh, you know, it reminded me the other day, there's this, apparently there's this Japanese woman, Kondo, I think her name is, who has been very successful at helping people, you know, tidy up their houses, their homes. And her thing is to make them like their clothes. So they want to fold them neatly and they want to clean up and stuff like that. And that then gets people to enjoy the task of tidying up. I have no trouble tidying up. I mean, I'm not very tidy by nature, but if I have to go in and tidy up, I don't mind doing it because I'm listening. I'm listening to my language while I'm doing it. I don't mind cleaning up the dishes. I don't mind uh, sweeping, cleaning, dusting, vacuuming. Uh, we have a quiet vacuum cleaner uh, because I can do it while listening. Uh, is, is it some, here's some word from Google Translate. I said it here from audiobook and read. Is it same? Okay, you know, the uh, text-to-speech is not good, okay? It's not as comfortable to listen to. I couldn't listen to solid text-to-speech. I can't. Like, Al Jazeera has text-to-speech on their website. I can't listen to it. But for one word or one phrase, particularly where you have trouble pronouncing, as in Arabic or Persian, you have trouble reading, it's very helpful. But I, I, when I go through my lessons at Link, I have the, the natural audio, like in, in Persian where there is no text to speech, I have the natural audio. So I listen and I go to sentence mode in Link. So I'm only looking at one sentence. I listen to the audio. I use the, the, the you know, the uh, loop back five second repeat. And I go repeat and repeat and repeat more or less where that sentence is. Then I move on to the next. So I'm much more comfortable listening to the natural audio. And uh, the other thing, too, is we have to connect emotionally at some level to what we're listening to. Uh, and that's why not only is it important, it's much better to listen to the natural voice, it's also better to listen to a voice that you like uh, because you've got to connect to it. It's got to have resonance. And text-to-speech doesn't have that. So text-to-speech has a limited function, but it is nevertheless very, very important in my experience. Okay. Kanji is the hardest part of Japanese. Yep. What is your favorite Chinese book? Well, I mean, the book that was quite fundamental for me is uh, Loto Xiangze, which is the, the you know rickshaw boy written by uh, uh, Lao Xia. Because I read that after about seven or eight months of learning Chinese. It took place in Beijing. I was in Hong Kong. The idea of China was still sort of a romantic place. I'd read about the the, the 20s and the 30s and the warlords and the, the Japanese war. And here's this Beijing that 30 years earlier was part of the Qing dynasty and was now gradually becoming part of the modern world. And here's this story about life in Beijing. I mean, I just found that book uh, totally gripping. So I would have to say that uh, Loto Xianzu by Lao Shou would be my favorite. Uh, what are your favorite now? Okay, some God first prompted me to set me weaving in. Have you prompt someone to do something, how would you add? If you had prompt someone to do something, oh, someone, how would you add it in your language? Well, prompt someone to do something. I, I don't, I must say, 
Or if you had learned from somebody to do something, how would you add it in your link? I don't understand the question, I must admit. Hi from Thailand. Hi. I have two questions. First of all, languages. It seems as though you try to search out lang large languages with a large speaker base. But what do you think of Tagalog? Well, first of all, you know, there are many reasons why you learn a language. Uh, I don't just learn languages with a large speaker base, but I'm somewhat more motivated to learn those languages. But I have learned Czech because my parents are from Czechoslovakia. I could never understand that language. I have, you know, newspaper articles at home from my father when he did stuff that was in the newspaper with his friends. They went mountain climbing or stuff like that. And, and I just was motivated. There's only 10 million people who speak Czech. Uh, on the other hand, there are very large uh, groups of people who speak uh, Indonesian or Bahasa, various flavors of it. I, even Tagalog is, I don't know how many speakers, but there's got to be 50 million speakers of Tagalog. I just don't know. I don't know the languages of the Philippines. So it, it's not just the number of speakers, but uh, it is an influence. And uh, one of the reasons why I didn't continue with Hebrew and went to Arabic is because there's far more speakers of Arabic than there are of Hebrew. But uh, Tagalog is an important language uh, spoken in the Philippines. I, I'm very curious to know to what extent Tagalog is similar to, say, Indonesian, Malaysian. I'm interested in languages, period. But I can only focus on one, or in this case, two languages at a time. Steve, I've been reading Japanese every day for an hour for three months, and I find myself getting lost in long sentences. If I keep reading every day, will this sort itself out? I mean, Japanese is a bit clumsy that way because you know, if I contrast French to Japanese, like the French, they like to say everything very logically and very cleverly and very elegantly. And whereas the Japanese has a different kind of elegance, and it's more that elegance of the sort of what's, you know, not stated or implied. And, and so it's, it's more difficult. But uh, everything, everything, even English spelling, it does it is a part of a pattern of a system and the more we expose ourselves to it gradually slowly the brain starts to sort these things out so you just and and i would in particular with japanese i would do a lot of listening because when we listen we get some momentum very often you read something and you don't get the sense of the emphasis the momentum the meaning whereas you hear the same thing over and over again you start to get a sense of how that language works so I would suggest that you do a lot of listening uh, as well as reading. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, no, I have, thought, I have no immediate plan to learn Tagalog. When you say you need useful content to add a language on a link, what all does that entail? Okay, we have said that if we get the 60 mini stories translated into any language, we'll put that language up on link. So we've got Gujarati, uh, we've got Bulgarian, these are not major world languages, but if we get the content, if we get that in Tagalog, if we get that in uh, whatever language, Thai, we will put it up. How do you do? Find the Chinese manuscript from 25 to 31. I will chase Zoran on that. Uh, if you wanted to learn Slovak one day, for whatever reason, I would gladly teach you. Thank you, Vincent. By the way, uh, in preparation for going to Bratislava to the Polyglot Conference, I did work on some Slovak. Uh, we have uh, the mini stories in Slovak, and I was able to buy an audiobook for which I was able to find the ebook, and I imported that into Link. And so I have a bit of a sense, you know, a yak becomes ak, and uh, hoborit instead of muvit. So I have a sense of uh, Slovak, and I feel I understand it. And in fact, I spoke some, uh, we had a meeting there in Bratislava with a bunch of people from the local community that the organization organizers had the range and I managed to say a few words in Slovak so I have the feeling and I did in town in Bratislava I went to shops and I spoke Slovak and people seem to understand me now no doubt my Slovak is heavily influenced by my Czech or even by my Russian but I communicate it and uh, I certainly I certainly understand it uh, but I, I thank you for the the offer and uh, but save that for the future uh, okay hello Steve do you know what oh, the PewDiePie people uh how to study on my how to study on my own martin i would suggest just go to link get on the farm talk to people do you speak in polish um it, you know <laughs> you know I, i'm so confused 
if, if, if I sat down with you for 10, 15 minutes, no, rozumím, ale aby movie, těžká, těžká, difficult for me right now. Um, no, Steve's posted a few videos in Polish. How do we get the mini stories? How can we get the mini stories? I don't know what you mean. The mini stories are available at Lake in those languages for which we have them. Uh, you can even, you know, you can download them, you can do what you want with them. Uh, but insofar as getting mini stories in new languages, we need people to uh, volunteer to help us uh, get them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Steve, what website did you use that had audio and text in Polish? Okay, first of all, in Polish, there is a tremendous website called realpolish.pl. Piotr, he has fabulous content along the lines of the mini stories. So first of all, you go there. We have the mini stories in Polish at link. And then with Polish, because I had sort of Russian, Ukrainian, Czech, very quickly I could read books. And so I went to a site called uh, publio.pl and I bought audiobooks for which I could also find the ebooks and they were available at that website and then I imported them into link that's what I did uh, what websites did you use there's another I think audioteka a u d i o t e k a has audiobooks and I think possibly ebooks in a number of languages certainly Czech Slovak uh, possibly Polish. You could check that out as well. Um, nom, 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 nom. How long does it take you on average to move on from mini stories onto more interesting and difficult content? Uh, this depends on the language. Uh, you know, obviously, if, if you are, if you speak a Romance language and you're going from, say, Italian to Spanish or Spanish to French, I think you can move very quickly because immediately you have the vocabulary. With uh, Greek, it was a little more difficult. Uh, with Romanian, not so difficult. With Arabic and Persian, much, much more difficult. So this is all a matter of, uh, you know, it depends on the language, depends on which language you know. Uh, you have to experiment. And then you can move to the more difficult and then come back again to the mini stories to refresh, to give yourself a sense of confidence. And then you charge in again and try and do some of the harder stuff. Uh, Steve, what would you recommend when I sentence moving with duolingual sentence cars in Anki, should I care about having a typing function to type in the answer, the English translation? Well, again, I'm not familiar with Anki. I don't use Anki. Uh, at link, I only type in the target language. And I use that for, you know, uh, writing systems like Greek or, or, um, uh, no, or even to improve my comprehension, listening comprehension. Uh, but I type in the target language. I hear it, text-to-speech, sometimes better, sometimes worse, I type it in. That's the only typing that I've done. Um, okay. Would you say overall Arabic is more difficult than Chinese or Japanese? That's so difficult to say. Uh, that's so difficult to say. I would say that... Um, Difficult, difficult in different ways, um, but probably less difficult because to me the biggest obstacle is always the writing system. If you can get to reading comfortably, then you can start reading a lot and reading a lot is going to improve you quickly. So while the Arabic writing system is still fuzzy for me, I know I have to read a lot more. Uh, learning characters is a whole other order of magnitude of not difficulty so much as workload but uh, it's going to depend on different people what they like to do I, I wouldn't want to answer the question which language do you most enjoy speaking in and why <laughs> I get that question I enjoy them all it's so much fun to speak in another language as poorly as I spoke uh, Persian I was delighted to be able to speak with my guests to that couple from Iran and when I go back to Vancouver and I go to a store where they have Persian employees, I, Iranians, I'm going to be happy speaking to them. Arabic, you know, there's a guy I buy my coffee from in Vancouver. And the first time I went there, I couldn't speak a word of Arabic. Uh, I've been there a few times and was only able to say merhaba. And now I'll be able to speak to them a little bit more in Arabic, and that's fine. So uh, <laughs> Arabic grammar also difficult for us Arabs, no doubt. Um, 
Okay, roughly, many passive known words would you say is required to comfortably read common media? Okay, how many passively known words to read? It? Okay, in, no, in Romance language, like if you already know English, you have 50% of the vocabulary in Romance languages. Second of all, newspapers are written at a lower level of difficulty than, say, novels or science textbooks. So newspapers are relatively easy. So, I mean, but I think that, yeah, 10 to 15,000 known words would be a good level. And uh, certainly at that level, even before then, you can start importing uh, newspaper articles into Link and start reading them. Uh, this is the advantage over languages where the writing system is so much more difficult for us, like Arabic. Uh, it's more difficult to bring in uh, newspaper articles and you're kind of fighting your way through. Every word is new. Whereas if it's a romance language and you speak English, you're going to know a lot of the words, you know, be able to recognize them. So yeah, 10,000 words. Uh, where do you find short bits of audio material for intensive listening? I'm learning Croatian, so it's a bit harder to find stuff for it. Okay. I mean, first of all, we keep on talking, you know, and we have a virtual assistant who lives in Serbia and I keep on bugging him to create the mini stories for us in Serbo-Croatian uh, so that I, I, we can get going on it. Um, but I mean, if you go to Google and put, uh, now again, I don't know what your level is in Croatian, uh, but I would first of all Google for in English for Croatian stories, Croatian, whatever. And then you can Google in Croatian for podcasts, you know, political podcasts. Google Croatian and something will pop up. Now, once you have the podcast, you can then go, as we said earlier, to Happy Scribe and have these transcribed. And now you've got material that you can import from the link and study. Uh, why, when we are reading something in the target language, we remember everything, but we leave the book behind, we're not able to talk to ourselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we forget stuff. You close a book and you've forgotten much of what was in the book. You look something up in the dictionary, you close the dictionary, you forgot the meaning of the word you just looked up. Uh, to get from, you know, listening and reading to speaking, you've got to start speaking. And when you start speaking, you won't have all the words that you can understand. And you just have to keep going. That's, that's the nature of our brains. We, we don't have photographic, most of us don't have photographic memory. Privet, Cartilao. <laughs> Okay, now, how do you study when your partner doesn't like the language you're studying? I remember you said that you listened in your car and your wife found it annoying. How do you do it? Okay, first of all, I cannot listen in the car while my wife is there. She's not going to listen to Arabic, you know, on the car radio while we're going somewhere. That's not going to work. I can't even put earphones in my ear while I'm with my wife because, you know, you're social, you can't just, but so my partner, my wife, it doesn't really care what language I'm learning. She's doing her thing and I'm doing my thing. Uh, now, uh, I don't know the canal polyglot. Uh, do you suggest a learning order regarding Chinese, Japanese, Korean? Uh, I mean, my order was Chinese, Japanese, and then Korean. Korean, which is still a work in progress. Um, probably starting with Chinese makes sense because you have to learn the characters at some point. And so that would be a good place to start. But it depends on what other factors there are, like what you're interested in, who your friends are, where you're living, and so forth. Hey, Steve, I'm learning Arabic and Persian as well, but I feel that I'm having trouble progressing forward. What are some or auditory resources you would suggest to help with moving forward? <laughs> Well, of course, you and I are both, uh, you know, masochists, uh, forcing ourselves to do two at once. But certainly Persian online is a great resource for Persian. And I have imported uh, all of their material into Link for my own use uh, with Arabic. And for both of them, I found the mini stories very useful. In fact, in Arabic, we have a lot of good stuff at Link. Who is she in both Arabic and Farsi? Uh, Arabic, I um, bought the Asimil book and I had it transcribed, so I have Asimil in Link. It's not that great. I find their stories somewhat silly and, uh, and um, yeah, very quick progression. Uh, Persian Online for Farsi is very, very good. Just Google Persian Online, you'll find it. Um, what else did I find? I, you know, uh, 
Manuel de l'Art Moderne, Harrop's, all these books that I found at various bookstores. I uh, sent the audio file off to a lady in Jordan who transcribed them. I now know that I can do that more cheaply. Uh, yeah, those would be some of the suggestions. You've got to Google and look. I had to Google and look. Uh, if you find any, let me know. Uh, okay, I've been struggling to learn Mandarin even after learning Taipei for a few months. Would you recommend watching children cartoons in Mandarin? I mean, it's background noise, but uh, essentially you have to listen and read. You have to learn the characters, uh, to my mind. Uh, I didn't learn Chinese without the characters, but I guess you can learn without reading. I just find that reading is such a powerful way to learn that I would, uh, I would focus more on listening and reading and nothing wrong with watching cartoons in Mandarin. Uh, listen in a sentence and try to, yeah, I agree. What is the best non-English text you have ever read? I, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, best in what way? I've let, read many interesting books in Swedish and Chinese and French, uh, you name it, and listened as well. How do you go about learning a language when there are people who mock you for doing so, even in this family? I mean, uh, yeah, people uh, consider me a bit of a nut for spending so much time learning languages. I mean, that could be any interest you have. People might find it strange. I just ignore those people. Uh, I try to learn phrasal verbs. I don't know how I should add them as link. They have extra words in a sentence. So, I mean, what you can do is you just save the phrase. Save the phrase. You can, you can tag them as phrasal verbs. Uh, you know, do, do save phrases and do use the tag function. Then you can re review those tagged phrases in the vocabulary section. Uh, pretty fine people. Uh, Steve, could you post a video of your tutor session and then the report from the tutor so we can see the structure and type of tutor we can aim for? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I could do that. I mean, not, not all the tutors want to be, uh, I did issue, like, you're not going to listen to an hour. I, I'm not going to put an hour of my lesson up. Uh, but I can share with you, uh, the report, but the report just is a collection of words and phrases. Uh, in in the, case, in the case of Persian or Arabic, uh, which I, you know, struggled with and I get that and I get the audio for it. So it's not very difficult. Just ask your tutor to make a list of 10 or 15 words or phrases that he or she noticed that you struggled with or couldn't remember or used incorrectly and then to record it. And then that then is sent as a report within link. I'm 16 and speak around five languages. What career can I pursue with the languages? That's hard to say. I mean, uh, I would say that you still need other skills. You can't say, uh, I speak five languages, therefore someone will hire me. You have to have something else, uh, technical or, or, or other skill, and then uh, more opportunities will come your way if you speak more languages. Do you recommend learning the radicals first to help with learning the characters? I found that, as with many things that are explained to us early, uh, that these explanations, explanations don't do much for us. And uh, so I, thought, I felt the radical explanation didn't help much until after I had had a lot of exposure to the characters and I started seeing the radicals. So I would say no, I would say focus on learning the characters themselves. And then after a while you'll start to notice, I mean, you can review the radical thing, but don't try and learn all the radicals. I don't. I didn't find that helpful. Uh, uh, according to your experience, is it possible to be a polyglot without traveling? Of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, a lot of the languages that I've learned, I haven't been to the country. Uh, when I was in China giving uh, speeches, uh, promoting my book 10 or so years ago, uh, we went to some of these uh, universities in China, and the, some of the students there were so fluent in English, Japanese, French, had never left China. Whereas we have Chinese immigrants in Canada who have lived in Canada for 20 years and can't speak English. So it's entirely up to how hard you work at it, your level of commitment. Help me gain total confidence and how on my Chinese speaking person immigrant you know, about four years ago, I'm educated and scored. Okay, so David Sun. So yeah, I mean, uh, total competence. Let's, let's be careful here. Total competence to my mind is what I would call B2C1. You can talk to anybody about anything. You use the, use the words correctly. And remember too that pronunciation is, is only a part of how you come across in the language. If you have an accent, but you use words correctly, elegantly, you create a very favorable impression on the listener. I remember 
my banker a while ago was an immigrant from Switzerland and he had a very pronounced Swiss accent. And he came to our office one day with his sidekick who was from England and the Swiss guy with his accent used the English language much better than his partner from England. So confidence is about using words correctly and you achieve that through a lot of listening and reading, a lot of listening and reading and then gradually you start to use the words and phrases that you gain from your listening and reading, you start to use them in your speech. And so very much, I think Link can help you achieve that. And to, to do that, you should be bringing into Link, because you have a high level already, I'm you know, surmising here, bring in you know, audio books, literature, uh, history books, subjects of interest to you, expand your vocabulary, listen to a variety of different things, listen a lot. And particularly if you find something that you like listening to, and I've had this experience in a number of languages, the voice, the subject matter, and this kind of penetrates your brain because it has resonance. And all of that enables you to uh, improve your level of confidence in the language. So good luck to you, David. And please, yes, you can do that at link. Will you be going back to Korean before going on to Turkish? Probably. Oh, and does anyone see these messages? I'm not sure if, yes, I see them. Yeah, I, I learned German without visiting Germany. Okay, I am educated, nah, 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 but I have difficulty understanding the news while listening to the radio. I have difficulty totally understanding the news in the newspapers. Yes, and therefore you have to, in fact, get beyond the news in the newspapers. You have to get, this is to David's son, you have to get to where you can read a novel, where you can listen to a novel. So the, the bad news, I guess, is that you have trouble understanding those things. The good news is that you have a great fun time ahead of you of, of uh, interacting with interesting content, but you have to find it. So import your newspaper articles into Link, work on the words and phrases, import books into Link. Uh, if you are, have audio that you want to work on, get it transcribed and bring it into Link. Because if you're listening and not understanding, you have to then be able to read it or else those words will forever be, you know, uh, non-meaning to you. Okay. I can, I'm learning French has a long time. I can read and listen very well, but no matter how much I try, I can't write in French. Well, then start writing, write more, write more, do it on the internet. You can look words up, you can look grammar points up and start writing. Uh, do you think Link will have a function to create a transcription out of podcast? Sorry if you've already mentioned. Okay. It's a moment to mask. Good. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're discovering there's more and more technology out there. So now we mentioned this, uh, Happy scribe. How we do that, I, I'm not sure. I think initially for, uh, where was this question? Yeah, podcast. So for us to put the podcast into our library, we need the permission of the publisher of the podcast, uh, particularly if we're going to add transcript. But nothing prevents you from going to Happy Scribe, and it's not that expensive, and, and getting these transcribed. If we can come up with a way, and we were just talking about this, that we can sort of integrate podcasts, uh, maybe we can, you know, just as we go to newspaper articles, we, we uh, you know, scrape them as it's called. If we can do that with podcasts and introduce transcription, maybe. But in the meantime, until we have a solution, I suggest you go to Happy Scribe and get your favorite podcast subscribed. Okay, maybe you would like it, blah, blah, blah. It strikes me how difficult we are when it comes to learning languages. Tell me some results I can use. Blah, 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 blah. As an entrepreneur, do you think someone who speaks a foreign language is more likely to have a successful career or do you think it's just a myth? I mean, there's so many things that go into being a successful entrepreneur, including luck, big factor, luck. However, it's a function of opportunities. If you speak more languages, you will have more opportunities. I can tell you that from my own personal experience but it doesn't guarantee greater success. I'm discouraged because after searching around, I have no place to actually use it. My Mandarin is very close to useful, but I can't use it. Okay, uh, we have to la love the language for the language itself. And if the opportunity presents itself, you use it. Uh, or if you say, okay, I wanna use my Mandarin, then you'll have to go and look for opportunities to work for a company that's working in China or go to China or whatever it might be. What's been your most favorite language? I don't have a most favorite language. Hi, I'm from Brazil. Steve, how are you? I greet you in Azerbaijan. Uh, very effective language. I wish one day I will. Okay. You know what? And I'm very curious about Azerbaijan because I don't know how different it is from Turkish. And of course, uh, 15, 20% of the population 
in Iran speaks Azerbaijani, but it's all part of that part of the world, you know. Anytime I have a chance to use it, is a trip to China. You know, I think Asimil gets a lot of favorable press. I'm not a, you know, it's to me, it's just content. Uh, I find a lot of their explanations are a distraction. Um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, L'apogee, no apogee. <laughs> yeah, I just enjoy doing it. I would say that I've put more effort into learning languages over the past uh, 10 years than I ever did previously during my life. And do you think most approach of learning phrases and expanding your vocabulary daily by talking to people? You know, to me, this idea that you can talk yourself to fluency is not very practical. Because who are you going to talk to? You can't just go around and bother people. Uh, you may find a sympathetic listener. Uh, you know, uh, you can go into, okay, I can go into a Korean bookstore and, uh, you know, try and speak to the person there in Korean uh, until a customer comes in who wants to buy a book. And now the lady uh, there has to uh, deal with the customer. You, you can't bother people. Uh, try and think of it the other way. If, if, as an English speaker, if people came up to you and started, sort of speaking to you in, in semi-English, how much patience are you going to have for that? So to me, it's not a, it's not a, a, a real solution. Uh, uh, but people do what they like to do. Study your target language and you can't find interesting content. You read sub -person. Okay, finding interesting content is big. Uh, we're going to put more sort of effort at link into f improving our library, bringing interesting content to the attention of people. Uh, in Arabic and Persian, I've just looked around for whatever I could find. I found Persian online. I Google, Google in English, Google in Persian, Google in Arabic. Uh, with Polish, I described what I did. I found the audiobooks and ebooks. It's everyone has to do that uh, on their own because everybody's interests are different. Uh, okay, when we listen, do we have to notice the words or let it go? Yeah, I just find that we notice more and more th things. Dobrivec, Steve, yes. Boy, I'd like to go back to Russia. That was fun. Uh, exchange. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. Do you think 35 applies to Chinese? Uh, uh, question. Uh, how many words for fluency? I don't know. All right. At that point, I got to run. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we're going to call it here. Thank you for listening. And uh, send any questions or put additional comments and questions on directly on the YouTube, and I'll answer them there. Bye for now.